In a recent video, we covered the incredibly rare instance of a meteorite reportedly crashing into the midst of an ancient battlefield. Here the impacts were largely metaphysical, with the shocks most notably rippling out across the era's religious and political landscape. But this raises the question, what about the physical aspects of meteor impacts? Were people ever able to turn such rare space minerals to their advantage? The answer is a surprising yes. In this video, we will explore the fascinating topic of meteor weapons, which were used by societies and armies across the ages. I absolutely love exploring mankind's relationship with space, which, as we shall see, was in our reach far earlier than traditionally imagined. Yet this was just a taste of things to come. You can learn much more about our species' grapple with space and the unknown through our sponsor Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that puts the vast library of human history at your fingertips. What's more, it takes thousands of non-fiction books and uses experts to distill them down to the most essential ideas for you to easily digest with text or audio in just 15 minutes. It's been a great tool for me to explore a wide range of topics from the 27 sections offered by Blinkist. As a great example, I was recently able to listen to Rocket Man by Robert Curson, which tells the riveting story of Apollo 8's mission to reach the moon, as well as Shoot for the Moon by James Donovan, which follows this up with the harrowing tale of Apollo 11's first landing on our orbiting neighbor. I'm sure that when you try Blinkist, you'll also be able to explore many hidden gems of your own. So check it out now by clicking the link in the description below to get a 7 day free trial. In addition, the first 100 people will get 25% off a full membership. Enjoy! The first question to address here is what exactly do meteors even bring to the table in the first place? Well, if we rule out fantasy ideas of magic users somehow manipulating their trajectories to bombard enemies, then what you're left with is essentially the randomized drop of mineral deposits. In this regard, asteroids are generally made up of silicates and heavy metals such as iron and nickel. Scientists classify these in three broad categories based on their relative balance of these elements. Stony meteors, for instance, contain around 90% silicates and just 10% heavy metal, and are by far the most common, with modern observations showing that these make up 95% of all meteorites which fall to the Earth's surface. Stony iron meteors, on the other hand, have about a 50-50 split in silicate versus heavy metal content, and represent just 3% of all observed meteorites. The final category are iron meteors, made up almost entirely of nickel and iron. Such specimens are extremely dense and rare. However, owing to their mineral composition, they are the most long-lasting. So what does all this mean to our story? Well, on the silicate side of things, not much. Earth already has vast quantities of these, and they are not of particularly high value outside of the novelty of their source of origin. Meteoric iron, on the other hand, is quite valuable, in some cases more so than gold. Recall that while our planet has much iron, humans long lack the capability of extracting and refining it from iron ore to the point of making it useful. This gradual advancement in our toolmaking gets reflected in the historical epochs of the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the later Iron Age. The last of these periods is typically categorized as occurring around the 1200s to the 800s BC. Thus, in the prior epochs, meteors provided the ability for humans to gain access to materials from a future age. Yet with that being said, I want to make one thing absolutely clear here. Iron is not necessarily a straight up upgrade over bronze. The two metals have a rough parity in strength, and weapons and armor of equivalent quality will perform about the same. The real advantage of iron is in its logistics, being from a single source of iron ore, rather than being like bronze which must come from sources of copper and tin which can be hard to come by. For iron though, the trick here is that you need far higher temperatures for smelting and more sophisticated techniques to get that iron, hence the delay in humanity's access to it. Meteors, however, bypass this hurdle in that they were formed in the furnace of space and can hand deliver ready-made iron to the planet's surface. The second notable advantage of iron is that once you have it, civilizations can start to mix it with carbon to form steel, which is indeed stronger than bronze and serves as an extremely useful metal that undergirds much of our own society today. So hopefully, this bit of explanation gives you more context on what meteors do bring to the table. Let's now proceed to some examples of how people in the past made use of it. One of our earliest records of humans interacting with meteoric iron seems to have occurred in ancient Egypt. It is here in a tomb within the Gerza Cemetery that archaeologists found nine small beads whose chemical composition bears the signature of extraterrestrial origin. 
analysis dates these objects to around the year 3200 BC. For context, that puts it right around the end of Egypt's pre-dynastic period. That's about a century before the Upper and Lower Nile had been united, and about six centuries before the Great Pyramids were built. Understandably, few records remain from the period, and there is little hope of getting any backstory on how these meteoric beads came to be in that tomb. At the very least, it means that at some point, some ancient ancestor of ours came upon a meteor's debris field. For an example of what this may have looked like, we can turn to the site of the Gebel Kemil impact site, recently found in the desert of southwest Egypt. Investigation reveals its roughly 200 foot wide and 50 foot deep crater, which was formed by a multi-ton object which sprayed thousands of pieces of meteoric iron across the area. Such a find would have been a treasure trove for Bronze Age people. Perhaps a similar site yielded the debris which was at some point collected and brought back to a workshop where it was ultimately hammered into some form of jewelry. Presumably, there must have been quite the commotion at such a discovery, and the manufacture of this item likely brought with it a high degree of prestige and value. Who knows how many times it traded hands, or for what sums it finally came into the possession of the individual buried at Gerza. Meanwhile, in Estonia, the Kali impact event left an even greater mark on the land and its people. Roughly four to 6,000 years ago, a huge meteor ripped through the atmosphere, erupting into pieces at an altitude of around five to 10 kilometers. While many pieces tumbled into the Baltic Sea, several crashed into islands in the region. Researchers estimate that they impacted with the energy comparable to the Hiroshima bomb, incinerating vegetation within a 6 km radius and throwing up enough dust to cloud the Baltic area for a day. It left behind a series of craters, the largest of which was around 110 meters wide and 22 meters deep. It's certainly impressive, and perhaps more so when we consider that the Bronze Age locals were certainly aware of this event. Archaeology, for instance, reveals that the site soon became associated with religious activities and was encompassed by a stone wall. It seems that the Baltic people also made use of this and other sources of meteoric iron for the production of various goods which again find their way into tombs and other material sites. This pattern repeats itself across the Bronze Age. For instance, in the ancient Syrian town of Tuba, locals once more stumbled upon meteor fragments. Here, archaeologists discovered another tomb dated to around 2300 BC. In it were found richly decorated remains, some of which were ornamented head to toe in gold and silver. It is in this apparent royal tomb that a pendant of meteoric iron was found, clearly demonstrating the high value nature of such items. Yet once again we must admit that this was all likely due to the novelty of the material rather than its intrinsic value as a tool. I'm sure you're wondering at this point, what about the meteoric weapons? Well, for such cases we must look elsewhere. The most proximal example lies in the Hadian settlement of Lakahuyuk. Here, another dig into ancient tombs uncovered an incredible find of a beautiful golden dagger encasing a blade of meteoric iron dated to around 2500 BC. Even today, such a piece steals one's breath. We can only imagine its effects when unsheathed by the badass who wielded this epic trophy long ago. But he wouldn't have been the only one with this claim to fame. Another meteoric dagger dated to within several decades of this Anatolian piece was found in Egypt. Once again the discovery was made in a tomb. The tomb of King Tutankhamun in fact, which contained many such stunning riches. In fact, further study have indicated that several other daggers and even the pharaoh's headrest was made from meteoric iron. Fascinatingly, early Egyptian writings indicate that they too were aware of the extraterrestrial source of this material. Textual references have been found connecting iron to aspects of the sky and ideas that deceased kings would eventually live as undying stars in the heavens. This connection is further reinforced in the 1200s BC when the new hieroglyphic word beyond put appears. Translated literally, it means iron from the sky. Some researchers have speculated that this sudden uptick in the references to meteoric iron may have to do with contemporary meteor strikes in the area. It's certainly an intriguing idea, considering that we find the neighboring Assyrians also coming to describe their iron as Barzilu, meaning metal of the gods, roughly around the same period. Yet more meteoric weapons appear scattered across the period the more we look. For instance, in the city of Ugarit, we have found an axe made from meteoric iron, while in far off Shang and Shu Dynasty China, several iron axes have been discovered. The latter of these feature beautifully carved bronze heads, which grip the precious iron blades from space. Over the centuries, we continue to see meteoric iron appear across the globe in various archaeological finds. 
Naturally, however, as technology advanced, its relative rarity and thus its value decreased. Yet even still, the discovery of free, ready-made iron would long hold its appeal. This was especially true in areas which did not benefit from the evolution of advanced metalworking. Let us now consider this topic. A great case study will be the Northern Inuit people. The harsh nature of their environment made it difficult for their civilization to develop sophisticated manufacturing capabilities. Instead, they relied largely on nature for their tools, creating items made of wood, stone, and bone. However, the Inuit tribes of Cape York were blessed with an additional natural resource, one of the largest known iron meteorites ever. Some five to 10,000 years ago, a massive rock crashed through the atmosphere above Greenland, scattering breakaway fragments across the ice sheets below. Some, measuring several meters long and weighing over 30 tons, were discovered by the local Inuit people, who called them Seviksoa. Using cold forging methods, they then used the meteoric iron to create arrowheads, spearheads, blades, and various other items. In short, the heavens had suddenly created a mini Iron Age. This boon appears to have had a huge impact on local trade, with pieces of the meteor later being found hundreds of miles to the east and west. Some researchers have posited that in some cases, this iron rush may have done more harm than good by rupturing the pre-existing status quo and may have even led to violence. Across the pre-Columbian tribes of the Americas, we see evidence that their primary source of iron was also meteoric or telluric in origin. Only as foreigners began to arrive did the native people gain access to larger quantities of iron through trade, and even by scavenging from shipwrecks. Conquistadors, for instance, were reportedly surprised to find Aztec chieftains with iron knives and daggers, despite having no accompanying smelting furnaces. The same story repeats itself in other similar situations across the world. The Nama people of Namibia, for instance, long used fragments of the Gibeon meteorite, while Aborigines of Australia made use of the Henbury meteorite. I could go on and on, but you get the picture. So where does this leave us with regards to our initial inquiry? Well, it seems that meteoric iron did indeed have an impact on societies across the ages by giving them access to futuristic materials often more rare than gold. Yet this rarity also proved to be what limited its overall effect, with iron from the skies often being relegated to the production of prestige items alone. Sure, some of these novelties were indeed turned into meteor weapons of various kinds, but there was never really enough of them with which to arm entire units, let alone armies. And even if we assume that an entire Bronze Age army was equipped with iron weapons and armor of meteoric origin, material analysis shows that it wouldn't necessarily have performed much better than bronze. And again, even if it did perform better, I don't think that that would have mattered either. At the end of the day, we must remember that battles throughout history were won by numbers, tactics, and ultimately morale more than anything else. So paradoxically, an army with space gear may have actually done better, not for any real advantage of their meteoric garb, but because of the psychological effects it imparted on either side of a fight. Ultimately, some of you may be a bit disappointed with this conclusion to the episode. However, I find it truly fascinating to consider how space debris drifting aimlessly for eons across the universe could randomly crash into our planet and suddenly find itself morphing the cultures it encountered, be it in the form of weapons, prophecies, holy sites, and more. At the very least, it's certainly fodder for some great what-if scenarios and some awesome fantasy novels in the making. Let me know in the comments below what you think about all this. I'm intrigued. A huge thanks to the patrons for funding the channel, and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.